Um, yeah, welcome back. Now we're going to get into the panel selection. I mean, panel part of the evening. Uh, first, we wanted to, it is my great honor to introduce Ella Maya Tail Feathers. I've seen all her movies. I'm a big fan. Um, we asked her to come and just share her experiences about the film, the significance of it to her. Um, yeah, without further ado, Ella Maya. Okay, maybe Elamai is not available right now. Oh, I'm here, right here. Oh, hi. hi. Awesome. Sorry, I was just getting set up. I'm actually here with my mom. Hi. <laughs> All right, thank you guys. Thanks for joining us tonight. This is exciting. Oh, um, yeah, we'd like to if you could just share with us your experiences, um, well, like what you went through while filming it and the outcome, like how the feedback affected you. Sure. Um, well, first of all, thanks for, for screening the film and thank you for uh, the really beautiful introduction. And um, also just thanks to everybody who joined on a Friday night. Um, I know. A lot of people just want to zoom out, zone out and watch Netflix on Friday night. So thanks for tuning in and watching, watching this film. Um, so yeah, it, it took five years to make uh, and was quite the journey. A lot of love and care went into making it. And um, I made the film because uh, obviously my, my mother is practicing medicine here on the reserve and I heard from her about everything she was witnessing on the front lines of this crisis. And I witnessed the ways that our community has been so deeply impacted by grief and loss. Um, but most importantly, I saw the ways that our community was mobilizing and all of the work that was happening on the front lines and all of the people who were just giving selflessly to find solutions to this crisis. And, you know, many of these solutions were were very radical um and i felt like what i was seeing in the news media was often portraits of our community that were framed through you know trauma and grief and poverty lens um wherein we were always framed at a deficit as though we were at a deficit um whereas what i was seeing was very different you know i was seeing a lot of hope and strength and hard work and people giving so much with so few resources and so many barriers. And so I felt um, really obligated to, to document what was happening. Um, and when I started this journey, I knew so little about harm reduction. I knew so little about the nature of substance use disorder or addiction. And um, I, you know, I, I think I knew what, you know, the basic population knows. Um, I, I had addiction in my family and I knew it that way, but I didn't really understand it in the way that I do now. And um, with harm reduction, the same can be said. I, I knew so little. I was kind of just at like the entry level understanding of what it was. And I was even kind of, you know, maybe hesitant to, to wonder if the, if the actions that were taken early on in this crisis were the right way to go. And um, that opinion changed very quickly uh, when it became very apparent that harm reduction saves lives and is absolutely necessary. Um, and I felt like I needed to also be able to share that learning journey, not only with my community, because that conversation is still so divisive and complicated, um, but also with other indigenous communities experiencing this, this crisis uh, along with um, being able to present the broader public, um, a portrait of my community that resists these um, really harmful representations that I was seeing in the news media. Um, and this conversation around harm reduction has become so contentious and, and divisive, not only within you know, my community and other indigenous communities, but I think 
Canada as a whole. Um, and I felt like this, this story and documenting it served as a really great opportunity to hopefully offer an educational tool um, for dialogue and, and, and understanding this crisis and the ways that harm reduction can work through a human lens and, and through centering the voices of actual people who are living with um, substance use disorder or who are in recovery or who are offering harm reduction services on the front lines. So yeah, so that's where it came from. And ultimately, you know, it was five years of work and hundreds of people contributed in some capacity to, to making this film. And ultimately over 50 people appear uh, in the film and so many more contributed and, and didn't end up in the film because, you know, I couldn't make a film longer than two hours. So yeah, it, it was a really wonderful experience to be able to document all of those, those stories. I felt so honored and humbled by the people who were brave enough to share their stories on screen um, because it's such a vulnerable place to be in. And, um, and I felt like I really had a commitment to centering the voices who are most marginalized and who are made vulnerable uh, in so many capacities. But um, yeah, especially during this, this, this crisis that's been happening, I guess, for eight, close to eight years now, I think. Yeah, eight years. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the, I guess, the origin story of the film and, and, and my reason for wanting to make it. Thank you so much, Elamaya. The film is beautiful and incredibly powerful, and I'm so grateful for the conversation that it continues. Um, and we're very grateful for you for being here, and you as well, Dr. Tailfeathers. It's really wonderful to have you with us. That's a really wonderful surprise. Um, so now at this point, we'd like to introduce the rest of the panel as well, um, and then continue this conversation. So we're just gonna be do a little bit of a brief introduction. Um, Brandy, why don't we start with you? Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, my name is Brandy Mayette. I am the Provincial Outreach Manager of AWARE, which is Alberta Alliance to Educate and Advocate Responsibly. Um, we're a harm reduction organization that is peer-led, and um, all of our members come from lived experience of drug use or houselessness. Um, we primarily focus on street-level outreach, uh, referrals, um, to support in agencies, hand out harm reduction supplies, and advocacy for the drug using community. Um, and on a personal level, my dad attended, I'm a Cree woman from Saskatchewan, and my dad attended um, George Gordon's residential school. So I'm a child of intergenerational trauma and all that lovely stuff, but I'm excited to sit on this panel. So thank you for having me. Next, let's go to Shannon. Hi there, my name's Shannon. Um, I'm a nurse. I spent the majority of my nursing career working with and for First Nations communities throughout Alberta um, and simultaneously with harm reduction for about 10 years. And so I've always been passionate about trying to advocate for harm reduction services uh, within First Nations communities. Um, one of uh, my personal experience was uh, trying to get programming going in the absence of a state of emergency um, when there was no funding available uh, was, was quite uh, a task. And during that time, my partner actually passed from a heroin overdose. Um, we didn't actually know he was addicted. And so that also um, formed uh, a lot of my nursing lens when working uh, with First Nations communities in heart protection. And it's just a beautiful film. Beautiful film. Thank you. Uh, Kim, do you want to go next? My name is Kim Porter, and I uh, live on Treaty 7 territory in Medicine Hat. Um, my son sits behind me in this um, picture, and he uh, died from fentanyl poisoning five years ago. At that time, I 
reached out for grief support and became a member of Mom Stop the Harm and then continued with that and an advocacy role. Um, now, proudly, I am a radical and an activist in this journey in Alberta, trying to change stigma and um, affect uh, drug policy changes. Um, it was a beautiful film, I feel um, so moved, um, so powerful, so beautiful, um, very emotional watching that. Uh, thank you for telling that story. I'm honored to have be sitting here with you all tonight. Thanks. Well said, thank you, Kim. Um, and Lori. Hi, um, well, GM, are there? I'm good, can you hear me? <laughs> Hi, I'm Lori Vrabosh. Um, I too am a, a, an active member of Mom Stop the Harm. I'm a provincial team leader now for Southwestern Alberta. I live in Bikini Nation, the sister tribe of the Blood Tribe, which is a nation which also has been hit devastatingly hard by the great numbers of losses we have and continue to have in the community. I am um, a person who has a lifetime of lived experience. I've um, suffered with substance use disorders myself. I'm five years clean and sober. I am a mother of another son who is now in an active state of recovery, which is great. And sadly, I'm also a mom who has lost a son at 25 years old three years ago to the opioid crisis. Um, I'm honored to be here amongst so many wonderful people, some of whom I look to very much as my mentors, like uh, Dr. Tail Feathers and um, a number of, of, of the rest of you, uh, Kim. And um, we work hard. I'm also uh, one of the founders of a new Lethbridge based nonprofit organization called We Will Recover, which also tackles issues um, about educating people. It's a family. Families Helping Families peer-based organization, which focuses on educating on uh, issues that will help families to help their loved ones. Because as we all know, especially in Alberta, it is the families that have become to a large degree, the frontline workers. Um, and it's, it's a struggle. I am very moved by being a part of this panel today. I recognize a lot of faces, including our friend, Mark Brave Rock. And um, I think it was a beautiful portrayal of uh, the fact that people can recover. I liked that at the end of the documentary, he gave us all some insight to know that people have made recovery. I think that's an important message for us, particularly in these hard and dark times. So I, um, I'm very grateful to join you all here today. And um, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Tailfeathers, do you want to add anything before we move on to the questions, just to put you on the spot? Hi. Um, no, just that I'm really grateful to be here. Uh, and actually, I'm just in the sidelines um, for once watching. So it's really nice to, to see all of the uh, people who are actively involved in trying to help in this situation and we've had quite a few uh viewings and q a's and um we had a really awkward one in cardston where it's a it's a, a dry town there's no alcohol in the town and very conservative area so we had uh showing i think it was two, monday night tuesday night. tuesday night and uh it was it was scary because it's a conservative uh, audience um, but we were very pleasantly um, surprised by the teachings from this film and, um, and the audience reception to it and the openness on discussing harm reduction, because at one time it was totally unacceptable to talk about harm reduction in the town of Cardston. But I was very pleasantly surprised by the teaching and um, the value of the film with an audience who does not believe in harm reduction. So I think we got somewhere with that and I'm very pleased that um, we're finding some common ground, which is what we need to do in order to change drug policy. So I just wanna give it back to Maya here, um, just enjoying the conversation and don't wanna take it over. Here you go. Thank you so much for engaging in that conversation. I know it's not always easy, but it's incredibly important. Um, okay, and so now we're just going to move into a couple questions, and I'm going to pass it off to Riel. 
Okay. Um, so we did bring these questions up at the beginning. We just wanted people to sort of um, think about what lens in is this film being presented through that has been omitted from previous films on substance use? And then the second one was, how does racism, mental health, intergenerational trauma, and stigma impact Indigenous communities beyond the opiate crisis? So we wanted to sort of open that up to the panel, I guess. Um, I'll speak to that. In, in Pikeni Nation, we struggle quite a bit still with trying to get leaders um, to understand and embrace harm reduction. Um, it's, it's misunderstood. And I think until we have an adequate amount of education that is culturally sensitive and appropriate, um, you know, delivered in ways that are appropriate for the audience, I think it's going to be very difficult to try to have First Nations communities um, embrace the idea of harm reduction. And we clearly know what happens when we don't. Uh, thus, we're seeing such incredible spikes in communities where harm reduction isn't widely available or if it's, if it's not available at all. Um, I think that it's important that we continue to stress the need for meeting people where they're at. One of the things, again, I, I'll say that I really uh, like about what the Blood Tribe is doing and what was portrayed is that there's a lot of outbound services that are meeting people where they're at. Uh, for example, the distribution of um, Suboxone uh, or Methadone to patients that otherwise might not be able to get in. I know that's a problem in our community um, where we don't have public transportation or um, reliable transportation. There should be dedicated services for the people. Um, I think that, you know, uh, again, sometimes helping, um, you know, the old people, the elders uh, and, and leaders, sometimes even managers in various departments to understand that, um, you know, abstinence space doesn't work for everybody, uh, particularly those who are struggling with opioid uh, disorders. It's really important. And I like that the film really stressed that, you know, Suboxone and Methadone and it showed how it was making the people feel who were the patients who were, were under the care of Dr. Tailfeathers or otherwise, um, you know, the response, how they're feeling. I think that it's encouraging to those of us who were able to watch the documentary to understand, gee, they're having success. And I think that, um, you know, it brings some relief and some understanding that these things are working. And ultimately that's what we're trying to do is, um, is keep people alive. Um, I think uh, just one of the things I was reflecting on watching the film um, is that it was an Indigenous lens uh, made by Indigenous people for Indigenous people that I haven't seen that before. I think capturing the voice too of the people experiencing substance use disorder is often omitted. I think a lot of times it's more um, uh, institutional based um, versus the actual uh, human story. I think that was captured beautifully as well. And it, it was just the importance of family, the importance of flexibility. Um, and, and as well, just the need for programming to be Indigenous led. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping that's something people will take away from this, because I'm sure it's igniting a lot of fire in people's bellies that if, if we, um, if there are certain people that have privilege that others might not, that we continue to advocate for funding and programming to be Indigenous led versus taking it on necessarily being partners. Um, so um, one of the other things I found really interesting was the perceived safety of people using substances. I was on a lot of working groups when things were going on with SCS down in Lethbridge. We were hearing things from other harm reduction people. We were hearing things from people accessing programming about how much abuse they were um, encountering in addition to what has always been a historical path of, of human right violation when accessing things like enforcement or health. And I remember thinking we do all these um, 
you know, when harm reductions within the colonial system, we often have to play politics in a way and, and doing a lot of surveys of surrounding communities to see what their sense of safety is, but never once was there any kind of truth being told about what the actual safety of the clients were. And I think that is very eye-opening and I'm hoping one day we could do something like that um, instead of always accessing um, people who quite frankly, I don't think are unsafe. <laughs> I think it's the people who are experiencing substance use whose lives are continually threatened. So it was just really powerful to see that and just, yay, that got out there. Yeah. Thank you. I think um, it was important um, in this film, as was discussed a bit earlier, is the um, the sense of hope uh, that was evident um, and how we saw the people journey and, and constantly have that, that hope at their forefront um, that was encouraging and different than other movies, other films that I've seen of this nature. Um, that seemed to be um, not evident in other ones. And considering the racism, the mental health, the intergenerational trauma, the, the, the weight on people living on um, the Pakani and the Kainai Reserve um, to be able to have a sense of hope, to have some light shining on them, that's that's um, encouraging and, and amazing, profound in my mind. Thank you. Um, I also really appreciated the focus on intergenerational trauma. You know, we have to realize that we can just take away the substance use without the healing and without that cultural connection because just eliminating the stigma and like, oh, I had a whole thing that I was going to say, <laughs> but you know, like just taking you out of all of those, the negative, um, like the life of addictions without actual like healing the family isn't going to resolve anything. Um, this will continuously still be an issue with either your children to come or the grandchildren. And it was really prominent in that film, like how many of the grandparents are raising the grandchildren and while well, the parents are still struggling and, you know, it's so, it's so commonly seen in indigenous families. So it was a good, a good focus. I also think the film helped shed some light on how um, it isn't a choice and how it's just not a matter of um, just saying no, um, how obvious that that isn't going to work. That was prevalent throughout the, the film. And I'm, I'm thankful for that. Um, if I can add to that, one of the things I think was also really important um, was the focus on the children. Um, you know, so many children are being left behind and so many children that the parents who are suffering with substance use disorder, they're really hurting with the loss of their children. And that in itself is another trauma that they're facing. And, you know, the work that has to be done and the encouragement of, um, you know, in this case, Dr. Tailfeather is working with the people, asking them how they're doing, reminding them of their, their love and, and, you know, concern and care for their children. I think that's really important. Again, I like that it was, um, you know, it sets an example for other First Nations communities and really for all of us, um, even the non-Indigenous communities about the level of compassion and care, because ultimately those that we have to really be, I think, utmost concerned about are the children as well. If we don't stop this, um, you know, or, or curb the losses that we're seeing, all we're doing is birthing another generation of people who will end up broken, homeless, you know, um, impoverished, uh, fractured, and ultimately addicted. So we're not getting there until we actually help the people to stop losing. And I think in addition to that, you know, the grieving, uh, you know, the film focused on the grieving and the losses that so many people have these days. And 
I know in our experiencing, pardon me, experiences working with the people, it's the grief of the continued amount of losses um, that is dragging people into addiction, even those of us, you know, that, that work in it or try to advocate as community members or, or band members or what have you. It's, it's really hard. The level of PTSD can sometimes bring us to places we don't want to be. And I know for First Nations communities that are just continuously losing one after another, it's really hard on the people. So drawing on that, I think um, it would be great to see even more supports made available for bereavement support and um, family support to help the families understand what they can do to try and help their loved ones recover. And I think that this, this film really helped to show empathy. Really, it, it, it's, a, it's a wonderful, example of what empathy really does look like. I think a subtitle for the film could be, It Takes a Village. And I think that that was uh, definitely showcased in it. Um, the village of uh, the people on that reserve and how they honestly cared for each other. And that one family that um, were able to um, take care of the child and didn't have to have that child taken away through Child and Family Services. Um, they, they literally, it's like wraparound support within that community. So much everyone, does anyone else wanna add anything before we move on? Um, just thank you for all those amazing observations and comments. Um, yeah, I, you know, when I, I made this film, I, I really had to do a lot of, um, I guess, you know, self interrogation about my own um, privileges as the filmmaker and the power I have in terms of making editorial choices and deciding what ends up on screen. And so, you know, part of my year long research process was watching like as many films about addiction as possible. And you see just so many common tropes of like sensationalized portraits of people using drugs or alcohol um, without any sort of context about what brought them to that point in their lives and what their hopes and dreams are. And um, it kind of removed them from community uh, because you know the people here who are living with substance use disorder still have community and family and you know hopes and dreams and and the portraits that I was seeing in these, you know, very common representations of, of people who use drugs, um, to me just felt kind of harmful and, and devoid of, of, of um, empathy. And, and what I was seeing from frontline workers and, and just sitting with people who, you know, live with substance use disorder, um, especially the Western Aboriginal Harm Reduction Society in, in the downtown east side of Vancouver, um, I really just came to, to understand um, harm reduction and the reality of drug users in a very different way um, and made me recognize that the representations I had seen in the media um, had really sort of made me think about it in a, in a really harmful way. And so I wanted to try and resist those common tropes in terms of putting these portraits on screen. Um, and also I, I tried to think about harm reduction in the, the filmmaking process and how to care for not only the participants in the film, but also my audience. Um, you know, everybody in my community has lost someone to this crisis and uh, my family is included in that. And I just thought about, you know, like how would my family feel if they saw this film and there were portraits of overdoses on screen? Um, and many, you know, many of the films about the op opioid crisis in particular have those images. And it's really triggering to see as a, as someone who's lost a loved one in that way. And so I just thought like, I don't want to do that to my family. I don't want to do that to my community. And so that was also a conscious choice just to think about harm reduction and caring for the audience um, as a filmmaker and as a community member and as, you know, a member of my family. Um, and, uh, yeah, and then so often, I think just more, more broadly, um, 
people who use drugs or who live with substance use disorder are so often left out of the conversation when they are the ones who have the lived experience and the knowledge necessary to help us find solutions. They're aware of the barriers that they face and, um, and their needs. And, and it's just, it blows my mind how they're often left out of the conversation. Um, and so it was really important to center all of those voices in this conversation and also just to show that there are so many different um, voices within the community who have that lived experience and um, you know there isn't one sort of stereotype of, of, of you know people who use drugs and and they are human beings deserving of, of dignity and, and empathy so yeah those were all things that I considered in telling the story and um, yeah, a lot of it just had to do with thinking about trauma informed care and, and in implementing that in my practice as, as a filmmaker. And then also just witnessing the way that my mother works with her patients and, you know, others in the community who offer those frontline services and seeing the way that um, they implement just traditional Blackfoot ways of treating our own community members and, um, and I felt like that was a really important important part of, of the process as a filmmaker was just to try and reflect what I was seeing within my community into you know, the process of making the film. Thank you for that. Um, question from the audience. Can the panel speak to some very specific things that we can do to continue this conversation um, and to save lives? What can we do? This is a, it's a very complicated issue. And we, um, so much uh, of the issue involves drug policies and how those drug policies need to change in particular in our province. Um, I uh, feel like I am um, a little bit of a hamster on a wheel and that I am not being effective in my advocacy as much as I feel needs to be to save a life. And so I try to focus daily on acts of kindness, um, however little or huge they may be. Um, I try to have a daily awareness of stigma that I have myself, and I try to check that. And I also think that people could look at the fear that they hold, um, which affects their stigma and the way they, they um, their thought process are around people that use drugs, people that struggle with substance use. So those are kind of three things I, I do act of kindness. I'll, and I don't, this is a small, small thing, but if I see someone walking down the road carrying big bags to go to the recycling bin, I'll pull over and I'll say, hey, do you need a ride? Hey, and you know, they get in the car and I help, I drive them, it takes 10 minutes out of my day to drive them to the recycling bin so that they can take their bottles in and get a couple of bucks. And they think I'm an angel. And it's such a small little thing in a day that, that, that I just hope that um, as it was brought up in the film that those little things are the things that can make a difference for someone. And so they're, they're simple, easy things. I'm not going to do much to change the drug policy, but I can do that. And, and then the other thing again is to check your stigma. Thanks. Um, one of the things that I think we can do or we should encourage people to do is perhaps consider joining the group Mom Stop the Harm, which I'm putting a link to in the comments here. It's www.momsstoptheharm.com, um, which is a, a Canadian um, group for families um, and for loved ones who have lost um, people that they care for, whether it be children or family members or other loved ones, uh, when they've lost them to a fatal substance poisoning and or for families and loved ones who have um, people who are in their circle who are suffering with active addiction. Um, it's a wonderful support group, um, you know, for, for one and for all. It's a group that is nationwide. Uh, it has provincial uh, chapters, and it's a very effective group for those of us that need the support. Um, they're available around the clock. I personally think that they've saved my own sanity a number of times. 
I think most of the um, very practical uh, advice and support and guidance mentorship that I've received has come directly as a result of my mentors and the others who are part of Mom Stop the Harm. Um, it's not just for moms, it's for all of us who have uh, experienced the harms and the impacts of um, substance use disorders. So I would personally recommend that to anybody who wants to learn about or who may need support for bereavement or for their loved ones who may be in a state of addiction. And for those of us who just don't know what to do, um, it's a great group. I, I think just um, one of the things that I would recommend is possibly looking at the history of drug policy and how it was formed, because um, it really is rooted in racism. Um, if you look at the Reagan years, if you look at Nixon's years and you start to go into the war on drugs and how it was formed, and that we really are ingrained to try illicit behavior change through fear tactics. And a lot of, um, a lot of our core beliefs, what we've been brought up with is through a lens of enforcement versus um, love or health or connection. And so I think if you really wanna start wrapping your head around how this has come about is to really look at the root of those policies because I think it moves people's understanding as well as challenging stigma. I know when the opioid crisis first started, there was on reserve, we don't always have enough money or power over the literature we use. It's provided to instead of the funding for to create. So we'd have to borrow from organizations. And I remember the, the poster of the toe tag and someone in the morgue. Um, and I had started to place it up in the community and I was like, uh, and I took it down as soon as I started and a woman said you, she she thanked me because she said it was very triggering and I think as the public we need to really keep an eye out for those things and challenge them contact the organizations who are putting them out um, because later on after I lost someone to overdose that was very triggering and we shouldn't always have to have personalized experience um, to necessarily see these things but um, I think looking at drug policy, the root of its formation, as well as the uh, colonial systems and what they're putting out for educational resources, um, the approach, I think continually needs to be challenged. I think there's a, a lot of really, um, there's some programming out there that really does rely on fear and shame. And I think if we could all work together to push that agenda away, it, it would be very helpful. Um, I, my telling you just to talk here, so so I will. But um, I think that, and I thank you for all the, you know, all of the discussion. It's always so, uh, for me, it's enjoyable to hear everyone and and to hear from different points of view how we can um, address the situation. So I mean, from I look at it as like a drop in um, or a ripple effect in a lake, and the very very center of it is the person who's involved in the you know, in the addiction and, and how do we support that person? And we move out from that into the second ring and that is family and, um, and how do we support family and how do we help them to, you know, to, um, you know, to at least get some rest because I know lots of family members, um, you know, one of the first um, cases that I had, there was a mother that was sleeping out in her car um, at night during the winter so that her son could stay in the house and be safe. So, I mean, and that's a form of harm reduction as well, but we had huge discussions about um, what was um, enabling versus what was harm reduction. And, um, and so I know that the middle of the ring, the middle of the circle is the patient and the person, what is going on with that person. The second is the family. The third is the community. What can the community do? And then beyond that, what can the policymakers do? And um, and here in Alberta, we are stuck at trying to educate and move the policy to a different level. I think BC has set the stage for us in a lot of ways. And um, hence the trip that we made to BC was very, very helpful in terms of helping us to, um, to strategize on how we were gonna do this. So going from that middle, the middle of that, um, that ripple effect, it's saving that life in the very middle of the, 
of the ripple. And so we start from harm reduction. How do we save the lives of the people that are there or the, the center of that whole ring? How do we support those people around them to understand what is happening to their family member and what they can do? Recognizing that, um, and I see that in so many of my patients' families and um, so many family members that when you're really close to a person that's addicted, um, there's lots of emotion, there's lots of, um, there's lots of anger directed at your family member because they just are not listening to you or they're not getting the help that you're bringing them to or, you know, it's a very, very difficult struggle for family members because they love their, their, their love, their, you know, child or their spouse or, you know, or their, their sibling. And they try, we try in the way that we think is what they need. Um, but we need to recognize that they will, they will reach out when they need to um, reach out and we need to build the services around them so that they're there, they're there and they're available when somebody needs them. Um, the other thing I wanted to say in terms of um, policy and, um, and affecting policy change is that I found that a really effective way of discussing this with people who do not believe in harm reduction and who do not believe in um, uh, opiate replacement therapy and, and uh, medical detox is discussing what's called the um, return on investment. And because people want to hear, well, how does that impact the rest of society? Well, you know, uh, when we started the detox, um, we have reduced the um, visits to the ER. We've reduced, you know, a lot of things by, um, by, by addressing hep C, HIV, the STBBIs, um, you know, uh, mothers um, bonding with their children and, and children not being uh, apprehended and taken into the child welfare system, which starts a whole nother discussion about um, the cost to the system of the child welfare system. And actually, we should be talking about the child and, you know, and this child's life, because I've seen so many 13, 14 year olds now that are, are on heroin or fentanyl and, and started through the foster care system. Um, so we really need to be looking at how do we address policymakers, because where we run into the wall is um, on policy and, and how do we how do we affect policy change? Um, because that's where all our frustration is. Um, it's in it's in people understanding the issue, and it's in it's in affecting policy and resources. And um, and the biggest um, thing I think in this argument is uh, return on investment in terms of reducing mortality, re reducing morbidity, reducing the strain on family and um, and on the medical system. So I think that's what we have to do when we do our discussing and when we do our um, our strategizing is, you know, we have to prove that it will reduce the burden to society if we do this in the right way. Um, can I just add that if anybody wanted to, wants to um, get more involved in the harm reduction realm, that AWARE does have community days and all of our chapters that are open to any volunteers to show up and come out with our outreach workers. Um, we have chapters in Lethbridge, Red Deer, Edmonton, and Calgary. And we also offer virtual and in-person harm reduction 101 training. Um, it's all of the dates and everything are on our website www.aware.org. Uh, one additional thing um, that I think might help people who live in rural communities or First Nations communities and any community right now uh, where um, there seems to be a lot of people suffering is to get uh, familiar with the virtual opioid dependency program. Um, the virtual opioid dependency program is a, a lifeline I know in Pekeni Nation and it has been for many, many people that we have encountered in the work that we do. 
it allows um, for individuals to make a single phone call and within an hour get in, you know, get a virtual, within an hour actually, you can get a consultation with a, a doctor um, who can help to address, you know, a person's needs uh, for methadone or suboxone. And typically they can get a prescription within about an hour. Um, which takes the immediate, you know, uh, crisis out of the situation because that person will, the, the, the um, withdrawals that they're going through can be mitigated through the use of the, um, you know, suboxone or methadone. And at least at that point, that person is out of immediate danger. Um, I'm going to uh, put a link to that site, and I think it would be an excellent idea that um, anybody who has tuned in this far should get familiar with that website, produce it, share it, um, post it on your own site, post it in as many sites as you can, keep it in your phone list <laughs> and make sure that everybody who needs it has the ability to, um, to get in touch with them. Uh, it operates 24 hours, seven days a week. I know that we personally have helped several people who in fact are still in recovery by means of being able to reach out. And it's particularly important in rural communities where accessing a doctor or areas even like Lethbridge where half the population doesn't have a family doctor. Um, they're very compassionate. I think that would be excellent um, for people to know that this is a resource that we can access to help people. Hi, Beric. <laughs> I think we just want to acknowledge that we are technically a little bit past our time, but we didn't want to interrupt anyone. We wanted to keep this going. Um, so I think Riel's just maybe going to answer or ask one more question, and then we're going to close with the prayer. Just so everyone knows, we just want to acknowledge that there are people hopping off at 9.15 for naloxone training. So. All right. Um, I don't think I had another question, but I I just want to thank the panel because everyone answered, like everyone had different levels of understanding, and you all brought every the table is so full is what I meant to say. So I really appreciate the conversation, and then I just wanted to um, offer that we close this in prayer. Um, I think that you know it was really emotional film um we're all sitting with our thoughts and you know maybe remembering people who might have passed and then i asked my cousin Beric many moon to do the closing prayer today so i'll let him uh hello everybody and uh thank you so much for gathering today in this way um uh, Elmaya and uh, Dr. Tailfeathers, thank you so much. Uh, see you guys. Um, yeah, I just, uh, oh, I'll say a prayer. I hold not the Niska Gulaga, Gichimanito, Wankatanka, creator of all things. Isu Issa, grandmothers, grandfathers, Animal Matsukan. Sinajana, uh, hear our prayer today, creator and spirits, kin spirits that take care of us. I say a prayer of gratitude and thanks for all the work that has been done here, all of the sacred and loving communication that has been shared here today. Um, I say a prayer for everybody that we have lost, who uh, is probably present for all the people out there who have been uh, witnessing the film that they be comforted and supported, uh, that our hearts be opened, that we find forgiveness and compassion and a way forward. Um, just a lot of gratitude for the visionary work that was done here and the, uh, the use of the voice and uh, the shedding of, of light to conquer uh, ignorance, darkness, and pain. So I say a prayer in a good way for uh, all the nations involved, all the people, everybody goes home and uh, is able to take care of themselves. That the people who are triggered are able to be supported and uh, have people hear them and, and hold them and support them in the ways that they need. Pray for that. And uh, I just um, give a 
deep heartfelt thanks to um, everybody who uh, is doing this beautiful uh, healing work. Miigwech, see us, guys. Atapias, when all my relations. Okay, I think that's it, everyone. Um, thank you so much for being here today. Huge thank you to our panelists um, and our two surprise guests. That was really beautiful. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, please watch for a follow-up email that will have more details and hopefully answer some of those last questions that came in the chat. Yeah, thank you so much. This was wonderful. And I'm so honored to be here today and I'm so grateful for everyone else that joined us. So thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Sister, she raised me up. Yeah, you know my mom, she checked out. Popping pills turned to pipe. Skin and bone, and she's not around.